Um, we are lucky um, and happy to have Dr. Aaron Cohen with us today. Um, he is professor of history at Sacramento State University and an expert on Russia. He is the author of the recently published War Monuments, Public Patriotism and Bereavement in Russia, Urban Libraries here, folks, uh, 1905 to 2015. Uh, the reviews are glowing. Uh, Steve Marks of Clemson University calls it the finest book on Russian culture ever written. Um, that says a lot. This in addition to peer reviewed articles, uh, media appearances, uh, guest lectures, including a really great talk um, that Dr. Cohen did for our Great War Revisited series back in 2014 called A Bitter Truth, World War I Art, or World War I in European Art. Um, I'm going to make sure that Jennifer is able to um, send that link out so you can watch that talk if you'd like to. So there's a lot to cover. So welcome and thank you, Dr. Cohen. I turn things over to you. Well, thank you. I, I hope that you can hear me and that you can all see the screen as well as me. I should be a little box in the corner of your screen. I wanted to thank the library and especially James uh, and Jennifer for putting this uh, event together. Obviously it's very timely and I'm sure that you have very many questions. Uh, and my plan is basically to cover a lot of historical topics rather quickly and sort of leave it up to you in the end to ask questions about topics that are of interest to you uh, or things that we can go more in depth on. Uh, so uh, basically, I think it's important to see the roots of this crisis and the, uh, the way that things are going to unfold in terms of the choices and the characteristics of the Putin government, right? And the Putin system. And in, in other words, in terms of the way modern Russia has been run for the last 20 years, right? And not in a lot of other things which may be important and which you may have questions about, such as national interests, NATO, Ukrainian policies, the United States government, or basically anything outside Russia. So my focus is really to explain uh, what I see to be the, the core issue or the core sets of issues. And I think one way to do this is to uh, try and explain this video, which you should be able to hear when I turn the sound on if you speak Russian, or uh, you should also be able to see the subtitles. So this is a short video or a short excerpt from the long speech that Vladimir Putin gave on February 4, 20, February 24, 2022, in which he announced this war against Ukraine. And in particular, what strikes me, there's two things to listen in this speech. One, how he talks about how a hostile anti-Russia has appeared on our historical territories. And one thing I want to do in this talk and in the question and answer session is basically explain what this phrase means. Because I think if you read that phrase and you are wondering what the hell is a hostile anti-Russia <laughs> and where are our, why are our historical territories in another country? And the second thing, of course, that he views this as a matter of life and death. In other words, as an existential uh, crisis. Here it is in his own words. Дальнейшее расширение инфраструктуры Североатлантического альянса и начавшееся военное освоение территории Украины для нас неприемлемо. Дело, конечно, не в самой организации НАТО, это только инструмент внешней политики США. Проблема в том, что на прилегающих к нам территориях, замечу, на наших же исторических территориях создается враждебная нам антироссия которая поставлена под полный внешний контроль, усиленно обживается вооруженными силами натовских стран и накачивается самым современным оружием. Для США и их союзников это так называемая политика сдерживания России, очевидные геополитические дивиденды. А для нашей страны 
это в итоге вопрос жизни и смерти, вопрос нашего исторического будущего как народа. И это не преувеличение, это так и есть. Это реальная угроза не просто нашим интересам, а самому существованию нашего государства, его суверенитету. So, uh... The short, the way that I interpret this entire conflict and the way I'll present it to, to you historically as a, a process, uh, you can literally view it as the death throes of empire, right? The death throes of empire. Uh, in other words, this empire is collapsing and has been collapsing and is continuing to collapse. And this is a violent phase of that collapse. And one thing I want to emphasize is that this is not a specific empire. It's uh, it, it's rather the vestiges of the previous empires of Russia that have consolidated into many minds into a kind of a mythical empire, right? Uh, in particular, in the mind of Putin, who plays a critical role in all of this. So in essence, what I'm saying, going to suggest is that the Soviet Union fell apart, but the decolonization process that led to that has continued, not just in Ukraine, but also in Russia, right? And part of the uh, uh, important aspect of this is that the Russians did not decolonize themselves enough after 1991, as the Ukrainians continued to organize their country as an independent state. So basically what's happening now before, I, before our eyes is an attempt at a war of conquest to undo the collapse of historic Russia, right, against the anti-Russia, which seems to be Ukrainian independence, but also the, uh, the entire, um, the way that he sees it, which I won't show uh, him directly saying this, but he does say this as anti-Russian values of liberal, Democrat, of liberal democracies in Europe as expressed in Ukraine. So a series of events have led to the perception that Russia faces an existential crisis and that no one in power seems to be willing, seems to, be willing to walk that back once it turns out that uh, the assumptions that uh, Vladimir Putin made as well as his close advisors seem to have gone completely wrong. So in order to, do, to talk about this, we have to talk about what empires are, how Russia came to be, what is the relationship between Russia and Ukraine, and uh, the, I'm going to try and do this without turning on the, uh, one way to think about this entire issue is uh, to understand that Russia's past is largely, has largely been unmastered by both most of the people as well as the political elites. In other words, uh, what, what mastering the past means is to is to willingly confront the terrible events in your own history. And in Russia, that has largely not taken place. Uh, you can look at that in several ways. Uh, opinion polls such as this, which even if you don't read Russian, you, uh, if you look at this opinion poll, which is conducted uh, in the first week of the war, basically you'll find that about 50% of the people in the Soviet, in Russia, view positively a return to the borders of the former Soviet Union. I know there's half the people say, I either strongly support or I rather support a return to the borders of the former USSR. So in other words, half the population hasn't basically come to terms with the fact that the Soviet Union fell apart and all of its former parts are independent countries. If you ask uh, Soviet Russian people, I see even my, I myself am confusing my terminology a little bit, right? The Stalinist past is also not becoming, uh, is not only not becoming mastered, it's becoming less mastered. Or if you want to put it, it's becoming more unmastered. Uh, and this graph is supposed to show you, well, how Russian people, when they're polled, have expressed views towards Stalin. And the main thing I want to get, have you get out of this graph is the, the uh, blue line, which is respect, has gone up dramatically, right? And it has pretty much gone up steadily since uh, the early 2000s. In other words, more and more people in Russia respect Stalin, uh, and fewer and f fewer people uh, are in, are, have difficulty answering the question. 
I also threw Ukraine in here, and you'll see that uh, whereas today 45% of Russians say they feel respect towards Stalin, only 14% of Ukrainians do. Those are those blot those circles on the far right of the graph. And what I, so part of the part of the task of mastering the past is admitting that in the first place you are uh, maybe the bad guys, but also that the present is different than the past. And that's one thing that not only uh, the Putin government has not done to get people to understand that the present is different than the past and better, uh, but uh, many Russian people who are living in the in uh, the Russian Federation. So what is the empire of grievance? That's the title of this talk. The empire of grievance is a term that I basically just made up for this. And I see the empire of grievance as a, a new way of thinking, as a way of thinking about Russia in the world that's promoted by the Putin government, the Putin system, which includes the elites in Russia. And, which is spread throughout the mass media and especially in broadcast media. And right now, that's basically the only media that there, that there is. So what is, the, what is an empire of grievance? Well, it's the consequences of an unmastered past. Uh, I'll just have this gift going in the background to show you the colonization and decolonization of the world since around 1500 until the present. You can see uh, Russia in the purple there, I believe. So it's the, the empire of grievance is part of the consequences of an unmastered past in which the loss of empire has not been accepted, right? Uh, in which the contemporary Russian culture has not yet been reconciled with a decolonized world of nation states rather than a world of empires. And the way that people have dealt with in the empire of grievance, the way that they deal with the loss of empire is not through acceptance, in other words, accepting it, but through grievance, right? And feelings of loss in the present that are projected from the past. In other words, uh, instead of saying we lost our empire uh, because of whatever actions we took, you tend to blame other people or other events or other things, right? That it's, we were treated unfairly. That's why we lost our empire. And this also results in the creation of a new kind of imaginary empire. This is the Russia that Putin has created in his own mind, right? An imaginary empire that faces an existential crisis in an age after empires. Because if there aren't any more, if Russia is the only empire left, Right. Of course, it feels itself at under attack and surrounded. And by Russia, I don't mean the country of Russia, but the leadership, as well as many people who are brought up in this way of thinking. And this has led in many ways to a return to a Soviet mentality of public relations that you see in that video clip, as well as in many other areas. Uh, public lying, the creation of alternative reality, epistemic closure, which means that basically you get no more information from outside your own system. Uh, and also the idea in Russia in particular that people cannot govern themselves horizontally, but uh, only can be governed vertically. And this has also resu resulted in a new kind of politics in Russia that is much more uh, similar to early 20th century right-wing populist authoritarian politics uh, than to anything from the Russians' own past, whether it was under Imperial Russia or under the Soviet Union. So in short, uh, current Russian public discourse has become infused with this populist patriotism based on grievance and fear, the fear of the existential loss of Russia uh, and grievance, uh, which seeks to blame others. And the main point I guess I would like to get across is that it's Putin's system that plays upon this and actually encourages it and encourages Russians not to master their past, not to accept the laws of empire, not to accept that they are in charge of their own fates. Uh, and is in a sense appealing to latent or unactivated grievances that are present in significant portions of the population maybe 
uh, maybe a little bit more at this time, maybe a little bit less in the past. So uh, before, uh, so that's just my general introduction. I'm going to very quickly go over the history of, you might say, the relationship between um, Russia and Ukraine in the past. Uh, by basically going back to the year 1600 uh, and talking a little about, about how uh, the process of colonization and the creation of Imperial Russia as a state uh, and its relationship to Ukraine. So as many of you may already know, the word Ukraine actually literally means uh, the borderlands or on the borderlands. And if you look at this map in 1600, one thing, it might be a little bit complicated for you, but one thing I really like about it is that it, it shows the, the actual borderlands and the borderlands that we're talking about are, is the area basically between the Tsardom of Muscovy at the top right. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. Uh, the Commonwealth of Poland, Lithuania in blue, and the Khanate of Crimea in, uh, in the south. And there you have this kind of white area and the fuzzy area. And this is where much of modern Ukraine emerges, right? So Ukraine itself was a, uh, is a modern state that's based on the process of a colonization process between various neighbors. If you look at the, uh, I can show you like in 1700, this is what it looks like. And by 1800, basically the entire area has been swallowed up by uh, Imperial Russia, what we call Imperial Russia. If you look at the actual ethnographic uh, uh, situation in this area of the world, uh, it's very complicated. Uh, and uh, it's often been associated with language, but the language issue is very, very difficult, right? Uh, I'm not gonna take credit for this map because I don't know exactly how accurate it is or what the criteria are for defining who is an F a Ukrainian and who is a Russian. But I think one thing you can take away from this map is how complicated the ethnic uh, identifications are, how this uh, along this region and how much especially in the uh, East, but also in the far West, but also in the South, it's better in the North, how it, ethnic groups are basically very mixed and that there are many different ethnic groups present in these areas. Uh, the Imperial Russian ideology of rule was not based on Russian ethnicity, for example. It was based on dynastic loyalty to the house of the Romanovs, who I'm very sure that you have heard about, the Tsar of all the Russias. Uh, and while Russia was the language of administration and of commerce and kind of the lingua franca of the Russian Empire before the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, Russian ethnicity was not. And uh, administrators came from various regions in Imperial Russia. They moved around, they spoke Russian, even if they weren't necessarily of Russian ethnicity. Uh, and the rule of the Tsars was based not on, usually not on cultural or ethnic boundaries. There's a few exceptions to that. And, uh, but Ukraine is not an exception to that. If you look at the area that we now know as Ukraine uh, in the 19th century, uh, you can see the modern Ukrainian state is indicated by the dark gray line on this map. Uh, the Imperial Russian uh, gubernia or administrative regions are all roughly the same size, right? They're, they don't really correspond to any particular ethnic groups or uh, other even geographical areas. And you'll note that part of this critically uh, of modern day Ukraine was never a part of Imperial Russia, what was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which you can see on the left side of this map. Uh, Russian, so Russia and Russian Ukrainian national identities both developed in tandem, right? In the 19th century, uh, but with different orientations towards the Imperial center and towards uh, the uh, normative ethnic identity for both groups, right? So I can just show, uh, show you, for example, the, in, in Imperial Russia, 
uh, the word Ukraine was not used until uh, and mostly illegal even until after 1904 when it became more common. Uh, instead, the Imperial Russian sort of ethnic the, the conception of Ukrainians in Imperial Russia or Ukrainian speakers were as little Russians. Uh, here's a portrait of some little Russians. Today, little Russian is used as, uh, is used as colonial language, by the way, and is not considered to be you know, an appropriate description. But in the 19th century, uh, little Russians were viewed by the great Russians or the people who we would call Russians as uh, people who spoke a similar language and who cooperated in the administration of Russia and contributed to it. Uh, the very famous uh, Ukrainian Russian poet Nikolai Gogol, I'm sure there are books in the library who you may have heard about, the satirist. He came from a uh, Ukrainian speaking region, but of course also made his name in St. Petersburg in Russia and at various times identified himself as a Russian, but also as a little Russian. Uh, and in fact, Gogol is a kind of, kind of person in the past who would confuse us because he would seem to be both Russian and Ukrainian at the same time, or perhaps neither. And he talked differently at, to various audiences at various times about his own ethnic identity. So the, the Ukrainians in, um, in um, Imperial Russia were seen by the state and by most uh, educated people as cooperating and contributing to the general life of the empire, right? Uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, that part that was separate and outside of imperial, um, the Imperial Russia, that's the area where the modern 19th century Ukrainian ethnic identity was developed. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was different was structured differently and had a different history, obviously, than Tsarist imperial uh, state. It was built from largely from already settled areas of very, vastly different ethnic groups. It was very difficult to centralize. The parts were recognized. And the basic part of the basic role of this Austro-Hungarian state was to co-opt or play against each other, uh, these various ethnic groups or sections. And it's there in Austria-Hungary that the Ukrainian national development, the use of the word Ukrainian, the standardization of the Ukrainian language actually developed in the area that we call Galicia. And there, uh, ethnic, uh, the development of the advocates of the Ukrainian ethnic identity define themselves, right? And their language, mostly in contradistinction to the Poles or to Polish domination within uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And we call these people Ruthenians. Ruthenians, that, that's the term that referred to Ukrainians before, or Ukrainian speakers uh, before, the, um, before the development of this Ukrainian identity or the word Ukrainian used to apply to an ethnic group. So uh, just to uh, just to quickly cover this point, I don't want to take too long on it, but I'm sure you'll have questions about it about languages and the differences between Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian. Those are all East Slavic languages, uh, but they all became differentiated and developed in the uh, course of the 18th and the 19th century by linguists and others like those in uh, Galicia who wanted to, um, you know develop uh, separate languages, and they are separate languages, right? There's a lot of political discussions in what's a language, what's a dialect, but the modern Ukrainian language is not intelligible to people in Russia who don't know what it, what it is. Even though many Ukrainians can understand Russian, that's because they've been brought up to understand it. And the people that you see in the picture who we called Ruthenians, they're actually peasants or farmers in the early 20th century, they probably call, they called themselves the Rus, right? The Rus, the Rusines. 
and the people who uh, lived in Muscovy and, Tsar and Tsarist Russia in the early modern period also called themselves the Rus, as did the, uh, the people who lived in what's now Belarusia. So uh, with the, at the turn of the century, with the Bolshevik Revolution and the Russian Civil War, uh, out of that came the, uh, came the Soviet Union, which you're all very familiar with, I'm imagining. Uh, and the main thing I want to uh, make clear about this er early 20th century and the process of the revolution and the civil war in Russia from 1917 to 1922 is that basically imp Imperial Russia fell apart. And then it was re and the parts broke away, including Ukraine, which was an independent state for a short period of time. But so were many other areas of the former Imperial Russia. But then they were re imperialized under different terms in the Soviet Union. And what the Soviet Union did as a part of the process of uh, developing itself in the early 20th century, I shouldn't say developing itself, what the Soviet leaders did, the Bolshevik leaders did, is that they gave many of those nationalities uh, their own socialist states and integrated them into the Soviet Union. So under the Bolshevik and under the Soviet way of thinking about empire, Ukrainian, they adopted basically the, uh, the educated Ukrainian and the Ruthenian or identity that had been developed outside of Imperial Russia, that Ukrainians were Ukraine and they spoke the Ukrainian language. In other words, the whole older idea about little Russians was jettisoned as an imperialist idea. So Ukrainians were viewed as separate people they had a state, the Ukrainian SSSR, which you can see on this map from 1999, uh, or you can see on this map from the early 20th century. Uh, they were understood as separate, separate people, but also they were helping, contributing to the administration of the USSR or the Soviet Union, much like the Little Russians earlier had been seen as contributing to the rule of the, uh, of the imperial state. So the Soviets try to have it both ways. They recognize the independent Ukraine and the independent Ukrainian ethnicity, but they also saw basically the Ukrainians as the, as the, the, the major partner the, the lesser partner, but still major partner in the operation and the, uh, and the administration of the Soviet Union. So they were separate, but not equal partners uh, at, with Russians first, Ukrainians second, Belarusians third, and so on and so forth, which is how the Soviets sort of saw the ethnic composition of these Soviet republics. And it's in the course of the 20th century, mostly, that the, that the whole problem of language and ethnicity and social change became wrapped up in a very complex manner that led to the difficulty in understanding who was who, what your identity was, what the most important aspect of your place in society would be, which is a really general way of saying, uh, sorting out the difference between Ukrainians and Russians became very complicated in the 20th century, which means sorting it out in the early 24th century, also complicated for some people. If you look at the, for example, the, uh, the, the majority language by town, city, and village councils, which is basically the lowest level of administration, right? You see all the little, uh, little uh, geographical units here. Uh, you can see that there are large there are large portions of the east and the south in which the Russian language is uh, primary is the majority language for those small areas, right? But whether those people identified themselves as ethnic Russian is very difficult to say, uh, because one th what happened during the course of the Soviet experience is that many Ukrainian farmers or peasants, in other words, Ukrainian speakers who lived in the countryside, they moved to the cities and the cities were largely Russian speaking. So actually many of the Russian speakers in Ukraine are Ukrainians whose ancestors, probably their grandfather or great grandfathers and mothers moved from the countryside to the city and began to speak Russian. 
And that took place at different times and sort of at different paces in different areas of the country. Here's another sort of depiction of the same, uh, the same uh, language uh, geography with a little more nuance to it on a somewhat higher level, kind of the, uh, the, uh, the provincial level or the higher administrative level. Where you can see there's kind of a spectrum where there are majority Ukrainian speakers and majority Russian speakers as you go from west to east and at, as you go from north to south. Uh, in, uh, in, seven, in 2001, which is what all this data is based on, the last census was in 2001, 17% of the people identified themselves as ethnic Russians in Ukraine. And that now that's probably around 7%. I mean, there hasn't been a census since 2001. But as you know, chunks of the Russian speaking areas were chopped off in 2014. And also there's been a trend in Ukraine for Russian speakers to switch to Ukrainian ethnicity. Uh, so a certain percentage of people nowadays even though they speak Russian language, more and more people are identifying, identifying as Ukraine, as, as Ukrainians nationality, uh, and um, also learning Ukrainian language, which you know most people are learning and many people, most people can speak. It's actually much more complicated than that. So I'll, I'll await your questions if you have more questions about that. The main thing you should get across is that just because somebody speaks Russian in Ukraine doesn't mean that they identify as Russian, and they probably don't. Uh, in, in 1991, on December 8th, basically the leaders of the Russian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic and the Ukrainian Soviet uh, Socialist Republic and the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic, they all seceded from the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union fell apart. All of these uh, areas became independent states. And it, it, it's at that moment now in post-Soviet Ukraine that uh, people and post-Soviet Russia, people had to understand that they were living, they had to come to grips with the fact that they no longer lived in a multi-ethnic empire of some kind or another, but they had a new state with people who had to find ways to identify with the new situation of living in either Russia or Ukraine, both nation states, neither conceived of as empires. And basically, to make a long story very, very short, uh, the in Ukraine, well, to start out with, I'll put it to you this way, uh, Ukrainians and Russians generally have a lot in common, not just their language, which is, by the way, not the same, but with some training, you can understand the other one. Uh, but also in this, there are sort of generic values. I don't know if you can see this chart, but it's based on a, uh, a political science study. And if you look to the left and the center of what's called Orthodox Europe, you'll see that Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, uh, the populations uh, have very similar attitudes towards uh, many aspects of their own lives as well as aspects of others. But since 2014, especially for reasons that I don't think we need to get into probably, uh, there's been a sharp shift in Ukraine in which Ukrainian views of Russia and of Russian leaders has changed markedly. And as many or even most Ukrainians have more and more seen themselves not only as coming away from the Russian orbit, but turning towards uh, Western Europe and away from Russia very actively, mostly due to the invasion of Crimea, which I'm sure that you've heard about and I'm not gonna talk about. But you can see from this graph between 2013 and 2015, big change. You can see it in this graph, also a big change right, around, right in 2014. This is a very complicated graph, but basically it shows that uh, both Ukrainian and Russians shared many ideas up until 2014 in roughly the same percentages, right? That, uh, for example, around 60% believe that the two countries of Russia and Ukraine should have open borders. And uh, only around 15 to, and about 15 to 20% in each country believe that Russia and U Ukraine must be in the same country. After 2014, a lot of divergence. 
If you just look at the number of Ukrainians who say that Russia and Ukraine must unite into one country, it's now around 5%, at least as of November 21, November 2020. Right now, it's probably 1%. But the, the number of Russians who said Russians and Ukraine might, must unite into one country has actually been steadily going up since 2014. It's, a pro, it's around 20%. It's probably even higher now. Uh, if, you, uh, if you ask, uh, if you break that down by region in Ukraine, you'll see that uh, many, uh, many Ukrainians uh, have, uh, have had highly negative attitudes towards Russia, uh, either bad or mostly bad. And even in the Eastern part of the country where uh, there are more Russian speakers and more sympathy towards Russia, uh, there's still about 50% of the people are, only 50% of the people have a positive view of Russia, which is saying something. And if you ask Ukrainian people, uh, if there was an independence referendum conducted in June of 2021, everywhere across the country, majority in favor. Even in the East, which is the far right graph, 53% of the people would be voting in favor of the referendum for independence. In other words, even in the most Russian area, more than 50% of people uh, would believe that Russia, is, that, excuse me, that Ukraine is an independent state. So I'm gonna finish up and talk a little bit about what this means in terms of modern Russia, right? Uh, and basically uh, the idea is that uh, most Russian people, 50% of Russian people, uh, and certainly Putin himself, really cannot accept the fact that Russia, excuse me, that Ukraine has become a, an independent state and has moved away from uh, that partnership uh, that, or colonial a relationship that characterized both Imperial Russia and the Soviet Union. And in fact, a, a lot of Putin's politics is based on exploiting grievances and airing grievances on both the national and the international and level. And basically, that's a way to show a to present a, a show of strength to Russian people on the part of Putin and Russian elites in, to cover the real economic and political weaknesses that uh, the country is experiencing in its um, years of independence after the Soviet Union. So just to quickly go over this a little bit, uh, the former Soviet republics that, what are the grievances based on that Russia has not become uh, a, a country that has changed a lot, uh, that is showing power and strength in the world. The former Soviet republics have moved out of Russian areas of influence, uh, especially Ukraine, as I just mentioned, but all of them have been, some of them forever, such as the Baltic states. The economy is still based on resource extraction and uh, the Russian economy is actually shrinking relative to other economic powers. If you look at this graph, you'll see that 95% uh, of Russian exports are basically natural resources, primarily oil and gas. And that little gray area of exports, the other 5% is arms and rocket motors and things like that. So. Russia really has not developed an economy that itself has uh, broken out of a colonialist uh, relationship with the rest of the world economy. And Russia itself has not moved into uh, the category of high income country, but it's kind of been stuck in the high middle area, which is an IMF, I believe IMF or a World Bank category that uh, ranks countries by GDP and uh, per capita. And you can see from this graph that uh, throughout the 20th century, the United States has become much more wealthy compared to Russia for obvious reasons. But even since 2000, the Russian economy has been uh, relatively 
uh, less growth oriented than uh, the United States economy or even many other economies such as in East Asia, for example, most notably China, but also South Korea and other countries, uh, Taiwan included. Uh, so you have the, the, what's viewed as a weakness on the world stage, as well as weakness in the country, right? Uh, and challenges from internal critics, uh, which resulted in 2011 and 2012 in broad-based social uh, protests. Also the development of the movement by Alexei Navalny to uh, challenge Putin directly. These are important ways in which um, Putin himself and the Russian elites and many Russian uh, people feel that they are under siege, that their way of life is uh, not developing the way they want. And instead of changing things inside the country, they basically have moved to deploy grievance politics, right, which is used to legitimize the authoritarian Putin system. So I think I'll be done in about five minutes. Right. Uh, so uh, as you're well aware, uh, Russia is uh, categorized as an authoritarian regime. It operates on its, it, it is not a totalitarian regime uh, yet. It operates uh, in a way at where um, you might say uh, a, a neo-populist right-wing authoritarian system, right? Which is really an ex con extra constitutional official oligarchy that attempts to have a depol depoliticized cultural populism. That's a, kind of a complicated way of saying that. I mean, it's hard to explain what the, how this country actually works, but I'm going to give it a go in a minute or two. And a good way of thinking about the the governmental system of Russia under Putin is that it's it's kind of an official oligarchy, right? Surrounded with Putin being the main oligarch, right? Uh, supported by what they call in Russia the power ministries or the security services, and Putin himself as a person is the focus of a system that distributes favors and money to high officials in the security service among the official oligarchs uh, using kind of uh, personal connections, massive amounts of corruption, right? And so in essence, Putin is the top oligarch. Any all other oligarch who uh, opposes him has been long uh, kicked out of the country or co-opted. He's the richest man in Russia. It, the wealth is spread around such that uh, those connections must be preserved at all costs. Otherwise, the, the, the system will cease to function and it all must be hidden from the public, right? Uh, because uh, once people uh, become prosecuted for corruption uh, or somebody gets taken out of the system, potentially the entire system could uh, fall apart. So when, uh, when Putin is talking about an existential threat, he's talking about an ex existential threat to his own personal power and the system that has supported government, gover governance in Russia for the, probably the last 20 years, uh, but certainly the last 15 years. So whenever his, legitimacy has, his legitimacy has been challenged either from outside of the country or from inside the country. Uh, Putin has tended to, uh, to blame others, NATO outside the country, uh, liberals inside the country or anybody who represents uh, Western values, which basically means for Putin, anybody who threatens to expose or criticize him, right? Uh, and what's important in this sort of a deployment of grievance policy politics, which which I think you probably can recognize if you see how uh, many politic politicians offer in this country and also European countries, is that the difference between the Putin regime and the Russian people and Russia as a country become obscured in public rhetoric. That is the criticism of Putin automatically is received and presented 
as criticism of Russia. And therefore, critics of Putin become traitors or subversives to Russia. And so in, in, a, ses- in a sense, this war is a war to save himself, even though it's cloaked as a war to save Russia and that Russia is acting in self-defense. And I'll just leave you with this, uh, with, with this other part of the speech in which he claims that a war against another country is taken in self-defense. In this case, I will turn to the citizens of Ukraine. В 2014 году Россия была обязана защитить жителей Крыма и Севастополя от тех, кого вы сами называете нациками. Крымчане и севастопольцы сделали свой выбор быть со своей исторической родиной, с Россией. И мы это поддержали. Повторю, просто не могли поступить иначе. Сегодняшние события связаны не с желанием ущемить интересы Украины и украинского народа. Они связаны с защитой самой России от тех, кто взял Украину в заложники и пытается использовать ее против нашей страны и ее народа. Повторю, наши действия – это самозащита от создаваемых нам угроз и от еще большей беды, чем та, что происходит сегодня. So I believe that Putin decided that his authority uh, was facing an existential challenge, both inside of the country and from an independent Ukraine, and that he was going to make sure that that problem was solved, right? The way that he decided to do that is to uh, change the democratically elected government of Ukraine make sure that it would never be in a position to challenge him, either military or politically, right? And that that is the goal of the current war, as well as uh, all the pressure that was put on Ukraine and the international community prior to the war in the recent months, basically over the last year. Now it's clear that in this war, this war will fail for Russia and will probably go down as one of the greatest mistakes in modern Russian history although obviously it is too early to tell. Uh, it, the irony is, of course, is that uh, Putin took this decision in defense of himself and his colleagues, but it may, in the end, bring about his destruction. So with that, I will just take questions and stop. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Cohen, um, for that that uh, sharp overview, um, historical context um, for where we are today. Um, everybody, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them into the chat and Jennifer will get them to me. Um, we do have some questions already and because I'm in control, um, I'm gonna start with my question. Um, for you. So we live in this world where we hear terms like misinformation and disinformation, and it's your job, uh, Dr. Cohen, to stay informed on the Ukraine-Russia crisis. What sources of news do you turn to and do you trust the most? Uh, well, I'll ha- I have two things to say about that. The first is just some general recommendations on uh, how to go ap- about looking for sources, right? Uh, and I recommend that people do not watch um, commercial news services or commercial television. Uh, almost all of the uh, news cable channels in the United States, they all are actually oriented towards making money. so. They tend to present the conflict in a certain way to get basically ratings. So I recommend that that people watch uh, European public broadcasting uh, that are in English. So I would recommend in particular Deutsche Welle or DWTV in English on YouTube or some cable channels, I imagine. Uh, France 24 is the French version of that. The BBC World Service is often very good. I find the radio t- service to be better than the news service, I mean, the television service. So those are good areas that I think uh, are a good place to start, mostly because they're not really ratings oriented and they're much more information oriented. 
uh, and they are of high journalistic standards. Uh, the problem with different in disinformation is very serious. And I, my approach to that is to, I, I, I mean, is to rely as much as possible on empirical evidence. That is evidence that can be, uh, that has been verified or that you yourself can verify. Uh, and um, I, obviously it's my job to evaluate evidence. I basically spend my entire career and most of my professional life <laughs> evaluating empirical evidence of various kinds. Uh, not everybody can do that, uh, but it, It'll be helpful for you to try. And one thing I would especially say is that it, it's probably not as complicated as many people think, right? Uh, those statements by Putin, they're a good indication as to what Putin is actually doing. <laughs> I mean, that's a kind of empirical evidence. Uh, many people, I think, are under the impression that there's some sort of uh, secret or hidden reason about why things happen. This leads to conspiracy theories and uh, you know speculation. But my view is, and my experience is as a historian, is that most people, they say openly what they're doing. <laughs> and the empirical, empirical evidence that is explained, that, that is found is, mostly val mo is mostly correct when understood properly and when contextualized properly. In other words, if you rely on empirical evidence, especially vetted by sources, journalists who are reliable, you're good, you don't need to search for like hidden answers about why things happen or be convinced about things that logically don't even make any sense. I know that's very general, but you may have some more specifics. So I'll, I'll leave it at sort of that general uh, statement or general okay. approach for now. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and one just little follow up to that. Someone had actually um, wondered uh, if PBS is a good source of, of news. Uh, you know, I never listened to PBS. Okay. I, I know they're a public broadcaster, so I think that they have many flaws as, a, as an institution, and their major flaws that even though they're a public broadcaster, they're really not very independent. They're highly, uh, and I just think that the European broadcasters are intentionally oriented towards, uh, uh, the PBS is oriented toward a, a domestic U.S. audience of politicians, right, and elites. It's not oriented toward explaining America outside to other people. The Europeans are more oriented towards uh, external uh, mm -hmm. audiences. So the politics is not quite as strong in, in their, um, the, the domestic politics of the country is not uh, as well expressed. That's a complicated way of saying, uh, I don't, I wouldn't recommend PBS for anything basically. Okay. Sorry, okay. thanks a lot, Dr. Cohen. Um, okay. So moving on from uh, information, um, oh, this is a good question. Um, will you touch upon the role religion plays in the fall of the empire and the current conflict? And I know you spent a little bit of time on that, but could you revisit? Uh, well, as probably most of you know, uh, Ukrainians and Russians are largely uh, uh, Orthodox, right? And in um, in the uh, west of Ukraine, uh, there are many um, Orthodox of the Catholic Rite, which is a complicated situation to explain. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, if you're asking if this is a war in which religious identity has a major role, I would have to say no, it's not. Uh, but I, I should say that the religious institutions have been highly politicized, right? The Russian Orthodox Church is basically a cultural arm and supporter of the Putin system. Uh, the, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church has been divided historically, but uh, now is coming together sort of to be, you know, uh, a unified 
Ukrainian version of that. So uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what your question is getting at, but uh, I, I think that's the way that I, I would look at it. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so, oh, another, a really good question. Uh, how important are Ukraine's natural resources and agricultural resources to Russia? And this takes us back to Stalinism and war communism and the kulaks. Um, what would you say to that? Uh, well, I would say that this is one of those examples where uh, I, I'm assuming the question is, is Russia attacking Ukraine to take over its national resources. That's how I yeah. understand the question, even though it wasn't stated that way. This is an example where I, I would look for empirical evidence, right? What's the empirical evidence that suggests that's the case? And I really don't see any, right? So that's not a part of the politics of grievance that I was describing. It's not been a part of uh, Vladimir Putin's stated reasons for this operation. It's really not been a part of the Ukrainian opposite. The, the Ukrainians haven't really said it either. So I tend to think that that really doesn't matter at all. Uh, okay. In the way that you are, I interpret you to understand, mostly because Russia is a very big country and basically has everything that it needs already. It literally doesn't really need anything from Ukraine in terms of uh, food supply, coal, iron, uh, metals, uh, industrial metals, or anything like that. So uh, I don't really see that as a motivation for this. Okay, okay thank you. Um, okay, so let's turn a bit, I guess, to the Black Sea. How important is Russia's access to the Black Sea for its warm water ports? That's a really good question, because that's, uh, that's, a, that's, uh, that's similar to the previous question, but uh, yeah. it gets to this whole issue of national interests and geopolitics and things like that. Uh, and also, it's the, the way the question is framed, it, it's basically framed in a, a 19th century imperialist way. I'm sure the questioner doesn't mean it that way, right? But uh, in an age in which uh, em empires are contending with each other, having access to the sea is very important. Uh, because you can't rely on other people to, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, there's all sorts of military reasons, but also commercial reasons why you'd want to uh, uh, not allow intermediaries to be able to interdict, interdict what you're, what you're trying to, as you try to interact with the outside world. But uh, most people, the world in the 21st century is quite a bit different from that 19th century world. And so uh, I've, uh, I think that uh, it's also not been a stated reason for this conflict. Interestingly enough, uh, it is the Crimea is very important strategically, right? Uh, but not in a way that most people think. Uh, mostly because it was the, it's the main port of the Black Sea Fleet. I'm sure many of you know that. It's also had considerable uh, uh, military um, bases on it both in the Soviet times as well as in late imperial times. And uh, so the actual, probably the, the actual primary goal of getting Crimea in 2014 was to make sure that the Black Sea Fleet and the other Russian military installations was actually a part of sovereign Russian territory. Uh, but the broader question of trying, the, the qu broader question of the Black Sea is, of course, that Turkey controls access from the Black Sea to the rest of the world. And that, uh, that tr that's the Treaty of uh, um, Montreux, which regulates passage through uh, the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles Straits. And uh, so, but, so, it so control, so Russia, Ukraine, they're not gonna have control of the Black Sea anyway. Uh, it's Turkey that actually has control of access to the Black Sea. So if the question was about is that, how is that, how is need for control of the Black Sea, lit, Northern shore or literal, how important is that to Russia strategically? It's probably also not that important in the modern era. Okay, thank also, you. Ru also Russia, by the way, just already has Black Sea access, right? 
uh, through its own sovereign territory. Okay. So we've heard this term a lot. Uh, what is denazification about? Uh, that's a good question. It's nobody as, actually understands what that means. <laughs> that's basically made up by Putin. I believe in that speech that I ver that I showed you. I don't remember if it's in that one or in a later one, but that's completely surprised everybody because nobody knows what that means. Okay. Uh, from what I read, it seems to me removing the government of Ukraine and installing a a government that's going to basically be a puppet regime or, or uh, a pro-Russian regime, a pro-Russian government. Uh, but if you're asking me how many Nazis there are in Ukraine, uh, there are none in the government. And uh, the, the right-wing extremist party, I think, in the last election got about 2% of the vote. Okay. Okay. That's a important stat. So um, next question, assuming that Russia can conquer Ukraine in the end, how will they be able to hold and govern it? Uh, they can't and they won't. <laughs> yeah. So that's a short answer. Uh, thank I, you. I mean, Next they, they literally don't have the military capability to conquer Ukraine and occupy it. Unless the Ukrainians surrender, but apparently not right. going to happen. A country the size of Texas. It's a big country. Okay, why, why hasn't Russia been able to completely pull itself together in order to have a better economy? Um, that's it, a great question because I, if I, that follows up on what I, my introductory remar remarks, uh, basically because of the way the Putin system works, right? Uh, the way the Putin system works, the, 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 based on corruption, kickbacks, the control of important sectors of the economy, such as the petroleum sector, communications by uh, very wealthy oligarchs, right, who support Putin and are on Putin's side. They don't really want to see changes in the Russian economy, right? If, mm -hmm. if, if the Russian economy changed, and um, I mean, let's just imagine a fantasy world uh, in which, you know, Russia became an, an export-oriented economy, which produced goods and services that people around the world wanted to buy, right? Uh, that means that the people who are now running the economy would lose out, right? They make money by selling natural gas and natural resources to Europe and China, basically. So any restructuring of the Russian economy is going to mean they are going to lose their money and they're also going to lose their political influence. And that means, and Putin is going to lose his money and lose his political power, which may, which has led to a uh, basically decade, three decades long, um, basically Russian economy spinning its wheels. Uh, or certainly, it's been growing, but it hasn't been changing structurally. And part of the reason is because the political system, as currently set up under Vladimir Putin, is not interested in really changing it because that would reduce their political power as well as their economic wealth. Okay, okay thank you, Dr. Cohen. Uh, next question, and, and they keep coming. Um, I think I heard Dr. Cohen say that this war would turn out to be a huge mistake for Putin. Can you guess how that might play out? Will Ukraine be turned to dust first? Uh, I think, I, I, I don't know what's gonna happen. I, if I prognosticate, and this goes on YouTube, people are going to, uh, in six months, you know, either I'm gonna get really lucky and be correct, or be way off. I think nobody can really predict how this is going to turn out. Literally nobody can predict how, how this is going to turn out because we're in a new situation. We've never been in a situation like this before. Uh, there's nuclear weapons involved. There's nuclear power plants involved. There's international sanctions involved. China is involved, right? Um, so, not involved in the war directly, but I mean, as uh, you know, a participate in shaping a post-war period, uh, it's 
it's very difficult to predict. But one thing that you can predict is that this war is extremely costly for the Russian government. They are not going to have all the other uh, countries that were relying on Russian, except for China, that are relying on Russian gas, are trying to wean themselves off very quickly from Russian energy. So their income is probably going to go down. They cannot, this, because of the sanctions, they cannot make use of a lot of their hard currency and other, um, in, a, and or even operate their tri, uh, international economic institutions very well. They can do some of them. It's just very difficult. So I think most people, the center of living in Ru for Russian people is going to go down. So uh, getting out of that is going to be extremely difficult, right? For Russian government, if Putin, well, any Russian government, even if Putin is overthrown or quits, uh, they're going to, it's going to be a long time before Russia comes back. Uh, to any sort of stable economic or political situation. Ukraine, of course, is, is the one that it, Ukrainian people are the ones that are suffering, you know, the most physically. Oh, that's helpful. And uh, I don't know how that's happening. Somebody's squiggling on my on my uh, PowerPoint. I'm not not sure how that's happening. Uh, but uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. Ukraine will be, uh, you know, if Ukraine is destroyed and many thousands, tens of thousands of people are killed. Uh, but afterward, afterward, uh, a lot of money is going to go into Ukraine. It will be rebuilt, you know, provided it's not under the control of Russia, which we're assuming. Uh, a lot of institutions uh, th that uh, are going to support Ukraine. And of course, Ukrainian people are now basically to follow my talk. Uh, are going to be fully Ukrainian, right? The number of Ukrainians who identify as Russian is going to be very, very low. So uh, in terms of the construction of a nation state in the aftermath of empire, Ukraine is going to be in a much better position. Whereas Russian people are pr probably going to be very confused and also upset and grieving for many, many years. Okay, okay. thank you, Dr. Cohen. Uh, Next, next question, um, and it relates to one of the previous ones about uh, denazification. When Putin refers to Ukraine's leadership as fascist, I believe this to be a distortion of history and a tool used to paint the current political leadership in, Ukraine's, in Ukraine as Russia's enemy. What eras, instances from history, in your opinion, do you think Russia's leadership is drawing upon? That's a great question. And I, you probably know the answer, right? Uh, the reason that uh, Putin is actually in a pretty weak position domestically, right? He, this war, if Russian people knew what was really happening in this war, uh, many of them would be against it, right? And he would lose a lot of his claim to be the legitimate ruler of all Russian people, of Russian people. That's why they have to control the media, right? They, as, and they have clamped down quite a bit. And that's why they have to create a narrative that Russian people will accept, right? So uh, the, 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 the view of the Kiev government and as Nazis is a direct reference to World War II, right? Which is the great event in Russian history in which all people will recognize as being all Russian people will recognize as being the, the most positive 20th century experience, the defeat of Nazi Germany, right? That they all share, right? So by terming the Ukrainian government to be Nazis or fascists, that legitimizes the Russian incursion into Ukraine, right? Uh, and he is using that language in order to to make a direct reference or direct analogy, excuse me, to what the uh, what the Soviet armies did in 1945, right? Which is basically in the in the Soviet view and also in the Russian view, save the save humanity from Nazi Germany. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. So let's 
turn to NATO uh, question, does, does Putin anticipate war with NATO? And sort of piggybacking on that, um, do you have any thoughts on um, the nuclear threat? Uh, well, the word anticipates a difficult word because actually all governments and all militaries anticipate conflicts and they plan for them, right? So uh, technically the answer to your question is yes, <laughs> because the Russian military is of course anticipating a war with NATO. That's their job to make planning for that kind of thing. Uh, but I don't think that I don't think that they're planning a war against uh, a NATO country, if that's what you're asking, to actually do it. Uh, that would lead to uh, a big, uh, you know, it would, pro it would lead to a world war and probably a nuclear war, which I think that you're referring also to in your question. So, uh, uh, and also if the way that I, uh, the way that I understand this conflict, as I explained in my introduction, uh, Putin really is interested in sort of reconstituting the idea of a Russian empire with a small e in which all of the East Slavic peoples are together. And so he is not really interested or has no stated interest in Eastern European countries or uh, even the Central Asian countries, I would say. I right, mean, thank you. part of the prop, if I could just, Part of the problem is though, nobody knows for sure, right? Everybody was surprised by this invasion. And they're also surprised by how poorly it's been, uh, it's been conducted. So uh, I, trying to predict what's gonna happen is very difficult, but I'm, I'm trying to suggest it's probably pretty unlikely. All right, uh, next question, short question. What happened in 2014? to create divergence? Oh yeah, so uh, what happened in 2014 is that, uh, well, Ukrainian politics between 1991 and uh, 2014, basically uh, as, the, as the Ukrainian uh, population and Ukrainian politicians struggled to uh, make sense of what it meant to be an independent Ukraine. What should the policies of an independent Ukraine be? What should the future be? Should the future be? And the two basic options that were discussed and expressed politically was to have a closer relationship with Russia, Russia economic and cultural space, or a co closer relationship to uh, Western Europe, European Union. And so the Ukrainian population was, you know, divided over this basic orientation, and so was the political system. Uh, in twenty uh, uh, between twenty ten and twenty fourteen, there was a a, a pro Russian government in Ukraine, run by um, President Yanukovych, uh, and. Um, I'm trying to make this as short as possible. <laughs> a pro-Russian government, uh, but Ukraine, a previous government had signed an association agreement with the European Union. In other words, that to prepare Ukraine to possibly put in an application. It wasn't even that developed. It was to basically harmonize Ukrainian economic policies with the European Union, uh, with the possibility of later on applying for U EU membership. Uh, this pro-Russian government basically abrogated that agreement and decided to pursue an agreement with Russia uh, that created a popular protest movement, movement in, the, uh, in cities across Ukraine, but most notably in Kiev, uh, including street, pro, pro, uh, street battles that uh, involved uh, police violence uh, to put them down. Uh, long story short, uh, Yanukovych, uh, fled the country. The Ukrainian parliament uh, elected a new president and uh, began the process of introducing a new constitution. And in this moment, uh, Russia in 19, uh, 2014, Russian troops basically uh, captured Crimea and uh, made inroads into the Donbass in the Eastern area that you can see. 
uh, sort of in this moment of weakness and confusion, the Russians took advantage of that to take the Crimea outright and to um, unofficially occupy the eastern parts of the Donbass. And that's the moment that basically started this, this war, right? Uh, there was a lot of fighting between Russian Ukrainian uh, troops and also Russian proxies in 2014, 2015. And so that's the moment in 2014 that really began to turn off Ukrainian people in large numbers off of Russia and to have them begin to reorient toward uh, Western uh, economic and political ties. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, okay. Another question, uh, the existence of Ukrainian nationalist groups is real and has been proven. And Putin has said that this is one of the reasons why he has entered Ukraine to combat these groups. To what extent can this reason be accepted for one country to invade another? Well, I don't know if, I think you probably already know the answer to that question. <laughs> whoever's asking it, uh, but your question is accurate. Uh, there are right-wing extremist groups in Ukraine as there are in all countries, including our country, uh, including in this very city where we live. Uh, the basic fact is that uh, wars are illegal in every, for any reason, unless they're, uh, they follow international law and uh, controlling the, uh, the political extremist political groups in another country is not a reason for war, right? Not a, not a legal reason to start a war. So the answer, that's the answer to your question, I guess, narrowly understood. Yeah, all right. Um, oh, this is a good question. Let alone whether oh. those extremist groups actually pose any threat to Russia, which of course they don't. So uh, it's, that, that again is part of the, uh, the, the narrative that's being told by the Russian government to Russian people to make it seem that what they're doing is the right thing. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, any thoughts on the new modern style of warfare vis-a-vis -vis sanctions and their likelihood of succeeding in ending the war? Okay, so I don't quite understand the question, but uh, many of you, I'm sure, are paying attention to a lot of the military um, chatter that's going about this and uh, how the, the uh, preparations for the Russian military uh, either were um, incompetent or based upon fighting a different kind of war that's actually being fought. But uh, I mean, I'm not a military historical expert, but it appears that, you know, Russian military really was not prepared and that the Ukrainian military is basically fighting a different kind of war, right? Based on um, the use of anti-tank weapons and drones and uh, which has proved much more effective than uh, you know, anybody could anticipate it. So it, it's possible that this conflict represents a new uh, moment in sort of military historical development in which tactics and strategies going forward in military areas going to, and weaponry is going to change quite a bit. The second part about sanctions, I didn't quite understand the relationship of that to the question about military tactics. Uh, but uh, the sanctions that are put in Russia are extremely harsh and actually harsher than any other country in the world at the present time. They're and it was quite surprising to uh, many people in Russia, as, as well as many people across the world. I think we were not expecting this kind of response, right? In particular, the, free, uh, the freezing of the central bank of Russia's assets outside of the country uh, is, the, is the most, uh, probably the most effective from the point of view of people putting in sanctions, because that uh, immediately removes billions and billions of dollars worth of assets uh, and takes it away from the Russian government, right? They, they basically have no, it's money they save to use to support their currency and for other reasons. But uh, most of those uh, foreign reserves have been frozen and are, are not accessible to the Russian government. 
Okay. That might make it hard for them to buy armaments if that's the link between armaments and sanctions, right? Maybe I'm seeing the link here, right? Also the sanctions on high technology, not in the short term, but in the long term will probably make it difficult for Russia to keep up any kind of war effort, you know, going forward. All right, thank you. Uh, why do people use the word annex? Uh, I don't really understand the question. Uh, so okay. annex means taking over another uh, piece of uh, a piece of territory and making it part of your own country. So that's okay. basically all it means. All right. Next question. Uh, when talking about Crimea, wasn't it an invasion and illegal taking? Yes, it was. In 2014, you're talking about, yes. That was illegal according to international law and also against the agreement that Russia had signed to, in 1994 to recognize the territorial integrity of uh, Ukraine. And Aaron, just going back to the question about sanctions and, and warfare, I screwed that one up actually. Oh, okay. I, th I think they were referring as sanctions, yes. They were referring to referring to sanctions as as a modern type of warfare. Oh yes, okay, I understand. Sorry about Apologies. that. Apologies. Sorry about that, questioner. Uh, but I think you're right. We're basically involved in a war against Russia right now, right? A, a non-military war, but one that's being fought through economic means. So uh, I think uh, you know most uh you know i think most kind of sanctions can be viewed as a uh as a reason for a war or a declaration of war it kind of depends on what the sanctions are from what i understand so not all sanctions would count that way but certainly uh because russia is a nuclear power uh we are confronting it through sanctions instead of through uh direct military means okay so I think right. that questioner is correct in their question. Yeah. So we, we're coming down to our last question. Um, and that's from Jen, uh, my colleague and librarian. Um, do you have any YouTube channels that you'd recommend people go to to learn more about the historical background or the current conflict? Uh, I don't really have any YouTube channels that I mean, there are a lot of good YouTube channels. Uh, I, I think I use YouTube mostly to watch the Russian language um, and the Ukrainian language um, news and interviews, but I think that those are always changing, right? Uh, because the Russian media landscape is, uh, YouTube might even be shut down in Russia in the next few days if it's not already, right, for example. So a lot of the channels have been changing around a lot. They kind of resurface under new names. Uh, so uh, I, I, guess, I, I don't think I can really recommend it. I would recommend the books that are on the list. Great, okay. Uh, so I'll recommend books instead of videos. How about that librarians? Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, we feel safe with that, comfortable with that. Um, and Jen just went ahead and, and reposted that reading list uh, that our selector did and Dr. Cohen contributed to. Um, and we've spent, gosh, almost an hour and a half um, listening to some really important insights on what's going on in Ukraine. Um, this is your last chance because I've run out of questions. If you have any questions for Dr. Cohen, to go ahead and fire them into the chat box. Um, and this could be the kind of thing that we revisit um, with, with Dr. Cohen um, down the road with things changing quickly. Yes, I would right? say, uh, well, if people are possibly putting in a new question. I would say we're really at a moment in which the future is very murky things could go many different ways. I think a lot of people, experts, uh, would not be able to predict what could happen, right? Uh, and so uh, I think possibly many interesting things could happen, many disastrous things could also happen. 
Uh, so I, I think this is going to be a topic that's going to be in the news for quite a long time. Okay, and actually, um, we do have a question. Oh, actually, it's a comment from um, one of the, the audience. Uh, oh, and here they come. They're coming back, the questions. Um, they And they state, I'd also like to recommend the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute's website, um, which has excellent resources on the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, I agree just, with that. That's very good. Okay. Okay. So thank you um, to you out there um, uh, who has posted that. Uh, another question. If sanctions have not yet convinced oligarchs to remove Putin, what will? Uh, again, we're predicting the future, but I think it's important to realize that in the Putin system, the oligarchs really don't have any power. So uh, it w I think uh, using sanctions to convince oligarchs to overthrow Putin was never going to happen. And I think the US and European governments never expected that to really happen. It's sort of basically they're just trying to do anything they can. They're throwing everything at the wall and kind of to see what sticks. But since Putin really has, uh, since those oligarchs are very subservient to Putin, uh, it's unlikely that any of them, they, they don't really have any power to like do, do anything, right? And most okay. of them are probably fleeing already. Right. I, I think the only, the purpose of sanctions, as I mentioned previously, is basically to degrade the Russian economy to such an extent that it's never gonna be in a position to do this again possibly it could degrade the russian economy to the point where depending on how this conflict develops it actually has an effect upon the ability of russia to prosecute this economy this, sorry this conflict i mean it's really hard to say it depends kind of how long it takes and uh, we don't always have good knowledge about what the russians are capable of for example russian army we thought it was capable of a lot of things it apparently doesn't seem capable of so it, it could be that the sanctions could have quite an effect on the actual ability of Russia to mobilize uh, material to fight the war and potentially could, you know, result in their inability to, well, to result in their loss, their, their losing the war. But uh, I think most people wouldn't expect that either. Okay, okay. The sanctions are more of a medium long-term uh, uh, point of pressure, I guess I'll put it that way. Okay, so uh, this is an interesting thought uh, slash question. If Ukraine wins the war, do you see Ukraine taking back Crimea? That's a really good question uh, because I think three weeks ago, nobody would ever expect that Ukraine could actually win a war against Russia militarily, right? Uh, I think in military terms, I think uh, I think most people think Ukraine can't win the war militarily, but I think many people think that actually they possibly it's not without out of the realm of possibility that they could, right? And I I I think that they, I mean, here's part of the uncertainty, right? They uh, I think any attempt for Ukraine to take Crimea is probably going to you're not going to like to hear this would probably result in the use of a tactical nuclear warhead in the, on Ukrainian territory from Ru the Russian side. So uh, I think the, the Ukrainian goals are to get back all of the territory that they lost and to return to the borders that they had in 2013. But I think the, it, there's, I think this is maybe what your question is getting at uh, if, if they militarily get to the point where they can actually occupy Crimea again, possibly it seems likely that under the current military doctrine that Russia has, which is to use a tactical nuclear warhead or to use tactical nuclear weapons in a case of an attack on Russian land, and they view Crimea as Russian land, that the response would be met with a tactical nuclear attack on Ukrainian cities, or at least, or military uh, deployments, okay. which would not be good, obviously. Right. 
Okay. Um, all right. So, so, this is so answer is theoretically yes, practically probably no. Okay. So this is, uh, okay. So China, uh, could we say that the only person who could influence Putin to end this invasion is Chinese President Xi? Uh, I, I don't know about that question. I think the Chinese would have a significant role to play diplomatically if they were to uh, put pressure on Putin. So I, I'm not sure that, that President Xi is the only person, but I think his opinion counts a lot. <laughs> and I, I think that the Chinese have stayed out of this, but pretended that they haven't stayed out of it. And uh, that's one of the reasons I think that, you know, the Russian, the sanctions are going to be so harsh is that China is really not going to make a big effort to help Russia evade sanctions, if you know what I'm meaning. That, they're not going to support sanctions, but they're also not going to help Russia get around the sanctions too much. Okay. okay. So I think the questioners, it's, nobody knows what will change Putin's mind. That's the problem. So she possibly could. Okay. But if I continue my thought, that would have to be a part of a broader diplomatic effort, right? Involving some sort of public uh, negotiation and not some sort of private deal, I think. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cohen. Um, Dr. Cohen, what and or when do you think the US or NATO will enter this war in the air and maybe ground forces between Ukraine or Russia? Uh, never, unless a NATO country is attacked. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, do you speak on the history of the global banking system? I don't. Okay. Okay. Unless there's a specific question about it. I'm not an expert in that area. Yeah. So, um, if you've got a follow-up to that for Dr. Cohen, um, go ahead and just send it on in to Jen. Um, but we did get a comment uh, from one of our uh, audience who supports a follow-up event. Um, and, I, and I think there are others who probably feel that way too. So we may, we may come back to you, Dr. Cohen. Um, and because Dr. Cohen um, knows so much about this, um, he, he has graciously um, let us go ahead and, and send, uh, post his email address so you can contact him directly at, at Sacramento State, um, and he'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, so we've gone a long time, over an hour and a half. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Cohen, uh, for your insights and the time you've put into giving us some clarity with this crisis.